Welcome back to Art as Idea. And today we are dealing with sacred spaces. Now, obviously we have to answer the question before us, what is a sacred space? And really, it's a broad definition. Let's be honest, a sacred space can be a lot of things to a lot of people, either individually or as a group, culture, society, etc. But for us, we're focusing on the concept of sacred, connected with God or gods, or dedicated to a religious purpose and so deserving veneration. Possibly a place for veneration. Really, is any space that is going to be sacred to a people? And when we deal with sacred spaces, we will see some common elements, not necessarily universal elements, but very common things like water or the use of light. But when we're dealing with the sacred, obviously we have a lot of different human cultures and a lot of varieties. So I'm going to try and touch on quite a few as we move forward. Now, in terms of questions, there are certain questions I'm trying to answer. How do pilgrims or visitors to these sites experience the space? In what ways are they guided in their religious practice by architectural design? Obviously, the form of a space can change how we interact with that space. Second, are there common attributes to sacred spaces, which I kind of touched on already? And third, why do societies put so many resources into the construction of sacred spaces? After all, it's a construction that isn't absolutely necessary for the continuance of life. It's not like shelter in the form of a home. Uh, it's very different, and we see, especially when we get to cathedrals and massive structures, the sorts of things that could take upwards of a hundred years to build, that could take the majority of the money available in a community and put it into something that is arguably not 100% necessary to survival. Not saying that it's not culturally necessary. That's a whole different ball game, a whole different issue. My goal here is to explore the idea of sacred space through time and across cultures to better understand our need and desire for these structures. And we're going to start with prehistoric and ancient. And the biggest problem that we run into here is because we are prehistoric for at least a couple of these, we don't have written records. We don't have anything telling us how their religious practices uh, happened. We don't have anything informing us why these forms are chosen or in some cases the very purpose of the sacred space or what we presume is a sacred space. So there's a lot of questions here. Remember, we don't necessarily have context. We're taking educated guesses, especially at Stonehenge. Stonehenge has always been a bit of a mystery. It has always drawn a lot of attention. While much about the prehistoric site Stonehenge is still really considered a mystery is clear that it is a sacred site designed with agricultural concerns in mind. And that will be the particular importance here, what we currently believe in 2020 is the particular importance of Stonehenge. The massive stones known as monoliths, each weighing up to 25 tons used to create Stonehenge would have been transported from, we believe, at least 25 miles away, and then placed at specific angles in precise spots to create a timepiece that calculates both hours and the planting seasons. That's going to be particularly important. Now, Stonehenge was designed as a circle of monoliths, with additional monoliths laid on the top to create a connected stone circle. And most people don't right realize that these are not simply stones set on top, square or rectangular stones set on top, but they have uh, mortise and tenon joints. There would have been tongues in between, and they are curved slightly to fit the curve of the stone circle. 
So there is a lot that goes into it. Now within the circle, we see a similar design of monoliths created in the shape of a horseshoe, which opens towards the northeast. Now, as we look at this larger and larger images moving forward, you will notice that Stonehenge is much larger than what you would generally assume. Uh, it is not simply the stones that we see. In fact, uh, we find a single monolith called the heel stone, which lies directly northeast of the circle. And here you see it at sunrise on the summer solstice and then from the reverse angle at the top. Now that gives you a point, a specific point. The sun will rise at the heel stone on the summer solstice. Now during the summer solstice, when one stands inside the stone horseshoe and faces northeast, you will see the sun rising over this heel stone. In fact, there is a number of alignments that take place within the circle. And while it's unknown specifically what the purpose of Stonehenge was in prehistoric times, and this is built over a 1500 year period, so the purpose may have actually changed over time or been refined over time. But the current theory is that you are looking at a prehistoric agricultural calendar. Now, why do I need a calendar in prehistoric times, especially in agricultural society? Who cares when it's Christmas? Well, actually, it's pretty important. I need to know, for example, when it is 60 degrees in February or March for a few days. Does that mean that planting season is coming or is that false spring? Now think about it this way, if I plant what is probably the minimum amount of seed that I've held back from last year's crop, having eaten the rest of it, because starvation isn't particularly pleasant, now I need to plant that seed, but I only get one shot at it. So if I accidentally plant it during a warm 10 day streak in March one year, that could lead to the death of my family because we'll get frost and freeze and it will kill the plants and now I have nothing to plant. So a calendar will tell me when it really is spring. It will give me that sense of the progression of the days. Now there are other ways to do this, but at this point we believe that Stonehenge would have acted as this calendar, uh, giving them a sense of exactly where they stand in the progression of the seasons. Now, of course, today, visitors flock to witness the sunrise on the summer solstice. They come as tourists. They chip off bits and bobs from Stonehenge. They bask in the mystery of it all because remember it's prehistoric we have no context now we have found human remains there and it has led some to speculate that this was a burial site now that's possible but let me remind you that we tend to bury people in sacred places for example on the right is a typical crypt in a church and on the left, a burial at Stonehenge. When you have some place that is special and sacred, you tend to want to be buried there. So finding burials doesn't mean it's a burial site. Just like finding burials at a cathedral doesn't mean that it was primarily a cemetery. It simply means that it's a sacred place that people want to go to and exist in the eternal afterlife or whatever their belief is in this site, believing it may bring magic, it may bring any number of benefits. Now this brings us to Teotihuacan in Mesoamerica or Mexico. The site of Teotihuacan near today's Mexico City was one of the largest cities in the world around 500 CE when it contained at least 600 separate pyramids, far more incidentally than we ever find in ancient Egypt. Now, very similar to Stonehenge, 
Uh, only a small portion of the site has been excavated thus far, and there is still much to be understood about this site. There are a couple of problems with Teotihuacan. It is named not by uh, explorers or discoverers in recent times, but rather by the Aztec, which is a problem because they see it as the city of the gods, something that only the gods would have built. So just like we see at Stonehenge, they see it as a giant sacred site and bury their dead there. Uh, their important dead. This leads to some issues because you have Aztec bodies next to bodies of Teotihuacan. You have a city that is existing in what has been until recently considered to be uh, a position of isolation. Uh, you have a lot of things going on here that are fairly unusual, but we focus on this central avenue, the avenue of the dead. Now, also similar to Stonehenge, we see an emphasis on solar movements. In this case, focusing on the spring equinox. And this is modern. I should make it very clear. This is a modern ritual. This is not something that we relate to the original peoples of Teotihuacan, at least not at present. But on the spring equinox, we see dance, song, burning of incense, and the climbing of the Pyramid of the Sun. And this is one of the largest pyramids that we see in the world. In fact, the Pyramid of the Sun lies to the east of the Avenue of the Dead, which runs more or less north to south. The pyramid, roughly 700 feet long and 210 feet tall, is stepped on four sides, each aligning closely to the cardinal directions. Now, the cardinal directions are slightly altered when you are in different positions on Earth because of where the sun is. Oftentimes, they're following the path of the sun and using that to determine east-west rather than more modern means such as GPS. And here we see a comparison of the Pyramid of the Sun with its cella, which is the little structure you see at the top here. And that has been removed. It was removed by the Spanish, more than likely. But we see a comparison looking at that compared to the Great Pyramids in Egypt. And we see the base is about the same. The height is about half of what we see in Egypt. The temple itself actually faces west towards the direction of the setting sun and the avenue of the dead. And when we look at something like that, that orientation becomes important. In some ways, this could act very much as a calendar. Watching the position of the rising and setting sun in relation to the pyramid may well tell you what season is coming. Now, in Mexico, we're not worried about cold and frost, but the wet and dry season would be particularly important to know, especially if you are primarily an agricultural society, which we believe the people of Teotihuacan were. They were closely tied to their crops. There's not a lot of uh, backup should something go wrong. Now, the pyramid is also built on a series, on a cave containing a spring, both of which the people of Mesoamerica at the time, we believe, believed linked to the gods, the underworld, creation, and the afterlife. Now, there's two important things there. The idea of a cave. Even in modern times, we often look at caves as entrances into the afterlife. Maybe not in the 20th century, but not we are not that far separated from those sorts of beliefs. And the idea is you're going down, that's where the soul ends up. Uh, and we're outside of Christian spirituality, so set those ideas of heaven and hell aside. Now, secondly, you'll note that I said a spring. Water is oftentimes related in some way to these sacred sites. Water is, of course, sacred. We have to have water to live. You have to have water every... You can only survive maybe two or three days if you don't have water. So it's going to seem particularly sacred. Now, when you're in the highlands of Mexico, that becomes that much more important. So, of course, you're going to build your sacred site on top of a spring, even if it's a tiny spring that would barely do anything. 
It still has an element of the spiritual. Simply in its, its existence, this almost miraculous bubbling of water from the earth itself. Now, throughout the area, we do find human remains, some within the rubble of the pyramid and some surrounding. This is evidence of human and animal sacrifices having been made, and this is not surprising in Mesoamerica. We have a tradition of human sacrifice there. Uh, we see in the upper left this depiction here of a sacrifice. This would be a Mayan uh, sacrifice, but you could imagine the same thing happen at Teotihuacan, probably on the top of the Pyramid of the Sun, so that people could see, and they're making those sacrifices. And we do find mass graves in Teotihuacan, but again, we run into the problem of are they Aztec or are they from Teotihuacan itself? It can be difficult to tell, at least up until the period where we have radiocarbon dating and strontium dating and other methods to uh, differentiate the forms and bodies. And it should be pointed out that there were bodies buried in the pyramids frequently. And that was usually to bless the pyramid. You are, of course, building a sacred structure. So you're going to make offerings to your god to sanctify that structure. And for the Mesoamericans, well, that's going to be human sacrifice. We can't deal with ancient sacred sites without dealing with the Parthenon, of course, a very famous Athenian temple. And to give you some time frame, we're about a thousand years before the Pyramid of the Sun. The Pyramid of the Sun, uh, of course, somewhere in the 250 to 500 CE range, and we're going to see the Parthenon built between about 450 and 430 BCE, so almost a thousand years in between. Now, the Parthenon in ancient Athens is built as a temple to Athena, the goddess of war and patron goddess of Athens. Here on the left, you see a reconstruction, very rough digital reconstruction of the Parthenon with all of its colors and pomp. On the right, the Parthenon as it sits today. Now, the Parthenon itself is a temple built high atop a hill overlooking the sea in part so that Athena could watch and protect the Greeks from further attack, but also because we typically as humans pick elevated positions to build temples. After all, the Pyramid of the Sun is nothing more than an artificial mountain on top of which they placed a cella, which is the actual functional temple. The first temple on the site would have been made of wood and probably contained a wooden statue of Athena or an owl. And we know later on there's a wooden statue of an owl representative of Athena that will be used on the site. But here we see that development from the Mycenaean in the Bronze Age. There was probably some form of temple there uh, to the archaic immediately before the Athenian classical period that we all hear about to the classical Acropolis of Athens later. But of course, what happens? Well, in about 479, Athens burns. Uh, if you've seen the movie 300, you know that this is going to happen. It happens immediately after the Battle of Thermopylae or what happens in the movie 300. Uh, the Persians will go to Athens. They will destroy the city. The Athenians have already pulled back at that point uh, to a more defensible position. Out of this, we are told that an olive tree, the symbol of Athena, will grow from the ashes. And this is thought to be a symbol that Athena wished the Greeks to rebuild, specifically rebuilding the Acropolis. So we've got a little bit of history. Let's talk about the Parthenon itself. The Parthenon and most of the structures on the Athenian Acropolis were built of marble. The Parthenon itself is an open rectangular temple loosely oriented in the cardinal directions with the entrance towards the east. Now that's really common as we've seen and as we will see because in the east we see the rising sun and most human religions, if you go back far enough, are based on the worship of solar deity. So we tend to orient things east-west. Even Catholic churches today do exactly the same thing. 
Now, within the Parthenon stood a colossal ivory and gold statue of the goddess Athena. This is known as the statue of Athena Parthenos, uh, which was later melted down for its gold, not surprising. Each of the two pediments, and by the way, uh, to go over the parts as we move in here, here's a basic uh, elevation of the Parthenon going towards the main entrance here. And we have the pediment in the triangular section at each end of the temple. Beneath that, we have what are almost comic book strips, known as the metopes. And then within that, uh, over the colonnade, within the peristyle, we see the frieze. And something to be noted here, if you're standing here like this guy, looking up, at the frieze it would be nearly invisible because the distance between these columns between here and here is quite small maybe 10 or 15 feet and yet this is going to be roughly 50 feet up in the air 40 to 50 feet up in the air so at that angle you're not going to see anything but let's look at how those appear in the Parthenon or on the Parthenon each of the two pediments of the Parthenon, now on display at the British Museum, shows scenes that relate to the power of Athena. On one side, the birth of Athena from Zeus's head, and on the other, the triumph of Athena over Poseidon to gain control of Athens. In a strange twist, the Athenians believed that they judged a contest between the gods. Very odd that you have humans judging gods, but it does happen on occasion. And they're judging whether Athena or Poseidon is a better patron god. We also have the Metopes. Now the Metopes are on the exterior of the Parthenon showing battle scenes. And these battles will, will take place between the Amazons and the Greeks. Between the Greeks, the Greek gods and the Titans, between the Greeks and the Trojans, and between the Greeks and the Centaurs. The overall theme of all of this is us versus them, basically saying that everyone else is barbaric in some form or way, but we as Greeks are civilized, we are better than everyone else. By the way, this is basically an uh, ancient form of nationalism, but you get the idea. The Metopes split up these stories, so the four stories, one takes place on each side of the temple and is broken into what are basically comic book frames, uh, telling parts of the story as you move along the building. Then we have the frieze, that frieze that you can't actually see when it's in place. But the frieze is there because the temple is an offering to the god, in this case Athena, and being a god, she could of course see it. It's a form of perfecting the building, even though no human will ever see it. The frieze that covered the interior of the Parthenon, as we saw, sort of the interior, if you're looking from the outside, but not really inside the cella, shows the Panathelenic procession, part of a festival that occurred every four years to celebrate Athena's birthday. And the festival would have included games and a procession, up the Acropolis, uh, in which the Athenians carried the sacred robe of Athena to be placed within the temple. They're replacing this, and the entire point of the procession, by the way, really common in ancient religions, that you see some form of procession every year or two years or four years. The point of religion in the Greek world at this time is about identity. By processing and showing your interest in the goddess Athena, it's not about necessarily finding good fortune with the goddess so much as it is declaring your identity as an Athenian. It brings everyone together, builds community. Religion at this point has nothing to do with morals and ethics. That's for philosophy, and that's something that we will get out of the Romans later on. So let's move on to sites built for polytheistic religion. So we're outside of the ancient world. We're moving more towards the modern, and we're starting with polytheism or the worship of multiple gods. And we're going to start at Khandariya Mahadeva. Now Khandariya Mahadeva 
is part of a large Hindu temple complex in India. And this specific temple, which is 102 feet high, faces east towards the direction of the rising sun. The site and temple are dedicated to Shiva. Now, to them, Shiva is the creator and destroyer of the universe. Many aspects of the temple will signify the harmony created by the unification of opposite elements, just like creation and destruction. So Shiva, for example, will represent birth and death, male and female, water and fire. They believe that you need to have a balance of these opposites. If you don't, then the universe will not exist in a form that any of us would want to live in. So the balance is going to be key. For example, the sculpture that covers the exterior of the temple is made up of sensual and erotic scenes that represent the universal harmony created by the joining of male and female in the dance of life. So they're taking these opposites, and one of the most obvious ones is male and female, and they're putting them together on the temple to give us this sense of the need for overall harmony and contentment. This isn't about pursuit of happiness, this is about pursuit of contentment and balance. Now, all of the site's temples have dynamic and intricate struck, uh, sculptures carved into their exteriors and are st structured to represent cosmic mountains reaching toward the sky. In fact, what you're looking at, and this is uh, the temple itself, when you look at the form, it is meant to mimic mountains because gods live in mountains. We tend to associate gods with elevated places, mountains, the sky, the tops of artificial mountains, etc. In this way, the temple represents the home of the gods and the site of creation, the largest peak there representing Mount Meru, M-E-R-U. Now, most of these temples include a central shrine with a statue of the god to whom the temple will be dedicated. In the case of Kandriya uh, Mahadeva, we see three sanctuaries. Uh, so we have the porch, and then we're going to have a series of three sanctuaries, including a small shrine dedicated to Shiva, a shrine dedicated to Shiva's wife, and a central sanctuary that houses a large phallic that is a symbol of Shiva, known as the Shiva Lingua. Linga. Visitors will circle the exterior of the temple before entering. And here's where we get a sense of balance. Now, you saw the outside, this massive exterior form. But, of course, when you get inside... It is far smaller. And in fact, here we can see clearly that all of this from here up is empty space that no human is going to enter, generally speaking. So all of this is just holding up the roof. This is the actual temple itself. So when you go inside what you would assume would be this massive expansive temple, something like a cathedral, is in fact a very small, very intimate uh, area. So this difference in size between the massive exterior and the confined interior is another example of opposing elements in Hinduism that complement and enhance one another. The size of the structure, and the juxtaposition between the massive size and the confined inner shrines really draws your attention to the intimacy of those shrines as well as to the massive size of the temple outside. The many sculptures on the exterior are meant to grab the pilgrim's attention. And the contrasting simplicity of the interior enhances the pilgrim's ability to meditate within the shrine. Again balance and juxtaposition, bringing out elements that we might not otherwise consider. Now, Issa Zhenzhou is the shrine of Issa, or 
Temple of Isa, and we are traveling to Japan, and specifically we're dealing with a Shinto temple. Now, Shinto is a particularly difficult religion to really research and study from a Western perspective. The problem is the practices are not uh, consistent. They are not universal. They change from district to district, from family to family, but here's a really basic description. Uh, we see a Japanese religion dating from the early 8th century and incorporating the worship of ancestors and natural spirits and a belief in sacred power, the kami, in both animate and inanimate things. And this would be the state religion of Japan until 1945. The United States will blame Shinto in part for the events of World War II and do everything it can to displace Shinto. But of course, that doesn't entirely happen. But that's a whole nother piece of history. Let's talk about the temple itself. Now, the site itself is a complex of 125 shrines built to worship spirits in nature, known as Kami. Most importantly, the sun goddess, uh, who is Amaterasu. Now, this goddess uh, has also been worshipped as the ancestral Kami of the imperial family, and so was originally worshipped at the site of the imperial palace. So there's a tie to the imperial family here. It was a particularly important site. Uh, we're seeing what is effectively a sun goddess or a kami of the sun being worshipped. Uh, and there's a lot of power structures going on in the background. We see that with religion all the time. Now around uh, 0 to 50 CE, the princess Yamato began searching for a new site to worship the goddess. And when she came upon the region of Isa, the goddess was said to have appeared to the princess and said, quote, It is a secluded and pleasant land. In this land I wish to dwell. Now, this happens within the shrine of Naiku, and I apologize for my pronunciation. So the goddess's sacred mirror is going to be within this shrine, which is one of the greatest treasures of Japan and represents divine support for the royal family. Now, we see a lot of monarchs with some form of divine support or uh, having received their power from God or the gods. It's really no different here. The terms are different. The principle is the same. And... These mirrors, something similar to this, and what you're seeing is the sun shining in the mirror, so it's not a magical uh, mirror or anything. But the mirror symbolizes truth in ancient Japan. Now, why? Well, mirrors can't lie. Mirrors show simply what they see. They have no way of altering it. This is not Instasnapachatogram with its filters. So, the honesty of a mirror has religious connotations added to it. Uh, the idea that this mirror will always simply tell you the truth of the situation. So these symbolize truth, and the yata no kagami also signifies wisdom. The chief priest, or priestess, who has guarded and cared for the site over the centuries, has always been a member of the imperial family. Now that's going to be important. It ties the imperial family to the religion just as much as the religion is tied to the imperial family. You need to have that two-way connection. You can't simply have the religion serving the imperial family. If it's one-sided like that, you will run into the power issues that we see in the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and even in modern times between governments and, say, Catholicism or whatever your faith is. We also see, let's talk about the actual architecture here, we see two equally sized adjacent plots for the shrine of Ise, one to the east and one to the west. These are used to alternately rebuild the primary shrine of Neku every 20 years. The ritual last took place in 2013, and here we see those two lots, the one on the left having been just rebuilt, the one on the right now 
prepared for reconstruction. What they'll do is they'll rebuild one. The other one is there so that you can continue to have worship and the Kami can continue to have a home. And then when you go ahead and replace the other one, you already have a fresh one built. So you see there's never a time that you don't have a temple. And these temples take on the form of a granary. Now, seeing that Shinto is a natural and agricultural faith, taking an agricultural symbol such as a granary makes a lot of sense. Japanese cypress trees that grow in the region are used to build a new shrine adjacent to the previous shrine while the old shrine is taken apart. This process signifies the destruction and regeneration of nature. It is also a practice that encourages a certain element of conservation, which makes a lot of sense when you're in the middle of an island nation and you have a limited number of resources to begin with. Now, when the shrine is completely taken down, a heart pillar is buried to mark the central spot where the next shrine will be built and the plot of land is covered with white rocks. And here in the middle, uh, what we see is here's the finished uh, temple. We're actually uh, looking at the other side, but this is a finished temple. And here they've taken down the old temple, but they've left this small building. That's where they bury the heart pillar. Uh, which is what we see right here. And then we see lines uh, drawn out in stone to mark out the new fences, to separate the sacred and the profane, to mark out important elements of the structure. The new shrine is built almost identically to the one that began the ritual of rebuilding back in 690 CE. So there's not a lot of change going on. It's not about updating. It's about preserving the practice. And why would you rebuild? Well, it becomes an element of spiritual reconsecration, but also helps bring the community together around this shrine. You can look at it and go, yeah, I took part in that, or I will take part in that when I'm of age. The shrine itself is 35 by 18 feet with the long southern side containing the entrance, it's very simple construction. There are no nails used. Most of this is mortise and tenon, so everything simply fits together. The roof is thatched uh, in a very traditional manner. The building is actually raised up uh, to preserve the wood for the next 20 years. And a veranda, or basically a porch, will surround the entirety of the shrine. The temple structure consists of cypress trees used as beams that rest on freestanding columns and a pitched roof made of thatched reed. Now, all of these elements that may look very uh, decorative actually play a role. For example, the ridge pole here, uh, along with these perpendicular members, apply weight to the top of the thatch so that it holds in place. Uh, here we have this massive cypress log that uh, we see another one on the opposite side, which lay out and hold up the ridge pole, the central pole in the center. We see similar construction on one of the shrines off to the side. Now we do, do see a little bit of updating. For example, this is not a thatch roof. This is a wood uh, or metal roof that we see over the entrance, but again, that's an entrance. It's not quite the same as the sacred space itself. And being wood construction in a humid area, you would have to rebuild this every so often. They're not building out of stone. And it encourages them to always have the resources necessary to rebuild the temple available to them, thus encouraging the conservation of materials in this island environment. Festivals are held throughout the year at the shrine to pray for and celebrate rain and harvest, uh, two key elements if you're an agricultural and natural faith. But only a member of the royal family may of the imperial family may enter the shrine itself and come in contact with the kami inside. Now we've dealt with polytheistic shrines. Now we're looking at monotheistic religions or sites built from monotheistic religions. So we get a sense of contrast between polytheistic and monotheistic. 
And one of the most important monotheistic sites that we're going to look at is the Cathedral of Chartres. Now, the cathedral shows the development of the Gothic style, as architects utilize flying buttresses and rib vaults to achieve unprecedented height, bringing the people, both figuratively and literally, closer to heaven. Now, you have to understand, most of these cathedrals are trying to create a miracle, really a miracle on earth. And to understand that, in the Middle Ages, when these structures are being built, Frequently, people are living in very dark, small structures, ceilings that are no more than maybe five or six feet high. Uh, they don't have much in the way of windows. Everything is very small. And now you walk into a structure where the ceiling is 80 to 100 feet up. There's tons of light. It's going to be a miracle on Earth. But let's start exploring that a little bit. Here we see definitions for flying buttresses and rib vaults. Now, cathedrals often had a special saint who they venerated, determined generally by the history of the town and the cathedral's relics. Now, those relics are going to be important. They're going to draw people in. Christian pilgrims would travel to different cathedrals, including Chartres, to view and pray to those various relics. Now, today we would look at this and probably term it tourism even though it has a religious bent. But then again, we have the same thing today. People travel to the Holy Land uh, in a form of tourism. What they're doing here is they feel like because these objects are said to be tied to certain saints, if they pray to the object or through the object, just being in the presence of the object would bring them closer to the person who either had it or who it used to be. So you would try and go to the major relics to try and find favor with these saints or maybe with God uh, themselves. So, let's talk about Chartres. Now, Chartres was built on a spring thought to have sacred healing powers in ancient times. And they own part of the tunic believed to be worn by Mary at the time of Jesus' birth, giving Chartres a long history of worship to the Virgin Mary. And here we see that spring. It's now used as basically sort of a well or a font, uh, but it's within the church. And by the way, let me remind you that this is not the first time we've seen a spring in a structure. We've seen a number of structures from the Athenian Acropolis uh, going back through a number of the pieces that we've looked at uh, that have had springs of some form. Springs are always sacred. They're magical and mysterious. It's water coming from the earth, which is not something we see on a regular basis. Now, when the tunic survived a great fire of 1194, and yes, I realize that's, a, that's the fire at Notre Dame that I see that is illustrated in the right, that's because there weren't any cameras in 1194, and it just works as a good illustration. So when the tunic survived a great fire of 1194, which destroyed all but the west facade, or the main uh, entrance side of the cathedral, the townspeople believed this to be a sign that Mary continued to protect them, and wanted them to rebuild. Now, this sort of thing is not unheard of. There are a number of things Chartres is known for, amongst them the rose windows, which are deeply integrated into the symbolism of Mary. They're also key to Gothic cathedrals. We see lots of rose windows. It's a very common element within Gothic cathedrals. And rose windows are these large, round windows that we tend to see in the facades, usually at the transepts and the west side of the church. So here, stained glass was often used as a metaphor in literature and art for, those, for the Immaculate Conception. That is, just as light passes through glass and enters the great cathedral without breaking the glass, the Holy Spirit entered into Mary while still preserving her virginity. Okay, so to contextualize that, we're putting that back in about the 12th century that those ideas are being written. Not today. They sound very different to modern ears. But 
everything in the church is going to be metaphorical. By the way, the reason they're using this glass, stained glass, leaded glass, is because clear glass is simply not going to be available, not in large enough sheets. But they do realize very early on that if you mix the colors, you can use smaller pieces with more flaws and put them together with copper and lead and create these windows that, if properly balanced, will let in light that is primarily white, even though you're using blues and reds and greens. Just like stage lighting, which focuses on RGB, red, blue, green, to create white. So if they're properly balanced, you do get a very white light. So stained glass is an innovation of the Gothic period. And strictly speaking, stained glass is painting on glass. It is not the act of putting small pieces of glass together. Now, when building the Abbey Church of Saint Denis, the first of our Gothic structures, Abbot Suger spoke of bathing the church in divine light through the use of stained glass windows that depicted biblical stories. Now where that becomes important at Chartres is here we see the pioneering use of flying buttresses and rib vaults, allowing for thinner walls and the ability to use substantial stained glass in the place of walls. Really, when you look at these cathedrals, oftentimes there are not walls as such. It's Everything is either a column or a window. There's very little in between. And here we see them uh, working on cleaning up Chartres Cathedral. You see how bright that is. You also get a sense of how white the light is coming in off the windows. It's not as colored as you would expect because they've balanced those colors, the reds, the blues, and the greens. The north transept rose window in Chartres is an example of the complex iconography of many stained glass windows. The rose window here shows the virgin and child enthroned in the center, surrounded by angels, kings in squares, and prophets in the outermost scenes. So, and then below are five lancet windows. The central one shows St. Anne enthroned with the infant Mary, and below them is the coat of arms of the House of France. The whole thing is really about motherhood and encouraging motherhood amongst the congregation. Now, this is important then as now, so 12th, 13th century, as well as it is today, because you need mothers to have children. In fact, oftentimes there are medals and things given to uh, mothers in the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany or elsewhere if they had four or five children. The reason is you need more children because a certain percentage of them are invariably going to be boys and boys can be sent to war. You need a large army, you need children, you see where this is going. The floor plan of almost all Gothic cathedrals is going to be cruciform or in the form of a cross symbolizing the crucifixion. Not necessarily something you pick up on if you're standing in the church, but something that as you become more and more familiar with its form, you would become aware of. The congregation generally enters through the door, which would be at the foot of the cross and walks down the nave towards the aisle. So as we're looking at this, uh, here's the nave. So this is where most people are going to be sitting during the service. These are the transepts on either side, basically the arms of the cross. Everything behind the altar, because the altar is usually at the crossing right here. Everything back here is going to be the choir. Just to give you some idea, this is the narthex, basically the lobby of the cathedral but they are generally in the form of a cross. Everything is symbolic here. Everything is metaphorical. They're thinking everything out. In religion, that's going to be particularly important. Now, cathedrals are commonly oriented so that the altar is placed towards the east, symbolizing the resurrection of Jesus, and to allow morning services to face the rising sun. So here we would have the east, uh, more or less that direction and the west over here. So in most churches, you would enter through the west 
the altar would be somewhere around the crossing in most cathedrals, and you are facing east so that the sun is rising from the congregation's perspective over the altar. That's important because all religions are based on uh, solar worship at some level, and so we continue to see that today. Uh, today we are told that churches have to face east because it, there's the metaphor of Jesus rising and the sun rising and those things being tied together. And when the congregation leaves, we see the rose window in the west facing in. So this is facing in towards the congregation. And we see a scene of the last judgment. This is designed to remind followers of Jesus' sacrifice and their duties as Christians, which are usually found on the western facade. In this case, the duty is to be good with a constant mind towards the afterlife. You must be good because otherwise you could go to hell or you could, in this time, go to purgatory. Uh, you want to go to heaven. So that last judgment image, an image tied to the judgment of Jesus over those who have died, becomes particularly important. We also see on the floor the journey of pilgrims, which is symbolized by an intricate labyrinth on the floor of the cathedral which people follow while saying prayers. This is a Christian form of meditation. It allows one to focus on a single problem and in doing so, hopefully come to an answer. And the labyrinth leads you, although not exactly directly, into the center and then back out. Uh, so you see that it kind of works like a maze. You're going back and forth, in and out, getting closer and further from the end point, uh, but you will eventually get there. It's sort of a metaphor of pilgrimage, a metaphor of life, a metaphor of decision making. So it serves a number of purposes, and this labyrinth is actually used today in a lot of meditation. You'll see the use of a labyrinth laid out, and it's kind of interesting because we see it in both Eastern and, as we see here, Western traditions. So we can't talk about monotheistic sites without dealing with mosques, and in this case, the Great Mosque of Isfahan. Now, the Great Mosque of Isfahan in modern Iran was begin in, begun excuse me, in the late 8th century CE and has had numerous additions even into the 20th century. I should point out that it's a very Western idea that once we build something, we shouldn't add to it. And actually, it's a very modern idea because if you had been there when Chartres was built, you would have seen lots of changes taking place that you wouldn't necessarily recognize today uh, as major changes taking place after the construction of the cathedral. We like to think things are built and then they should be preserved. But again, very Western idea. Now, mosques all have certain architectural elements in common, just like we see with churches, each designed to support and guide prayer towards Mecca five times a day. Now, Mecca is going to be significant, uh, specifically for Islam, for several reasons. The Prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca around 570 CE, and it's the site of the Kaaba, this large black cube-shaped structure which we're told is built by Abraham for God, and adding to that, we have no actual idea how old the Kaaba is. We do know that it predates Islam. Now, while many other sacred spaces are oriented in relation to the cardinal directions, Islam is concerned with the direction of Mecca. Add to that our general, and this is one, uh, general mosque structure. We see tall towers surrounding most mosques. These are known as minarets and are used to call the townspeople to prayer. We also see, as we move around the mosque, a prayer niche known as a mihrab. And this is placed on the wall that faces towards Mecca, and thus the faithful know the direction of Mecca if they are in a mosque anywhere in the world. We also see, interestingly enough, water. Yet again, one of those common elements. 
Now, pools and sources of water often surround a mosque, so that worshippers, in this case, may cleanse before entering. And you say, well, that's kind of odd. Well, we see the same thing in Shinto, we see the same thing in Judaism, we see the same thing in Christianity with holy water. The presence of water in a worship space, as we've seen, is incredibly common. Now, the Isfahan Mosque is known particularly for its four iwans. And these are entrances or gateways richly decorated in complex architectural forms reminiscent of honeycombs with these sort of three-dimensional patterns. And here we see the four iwans, or three of the four. These are the major entrances from the courtyard into the mosque itself. Each one has these three-dimensional sort of honeycomb-like forms. They're mimicking something called a Macquarna tile, which is a three-dimensional tile. Obviously, those are not singular tiles. That tile would be 10 feet or, or larger. They're made up of smaller tiles, but it's mimicking that idea in massive scale. Remember, oftentimes religious structures for monotheistic religions are in part about creating a miracle for the worshiper, trying to increase their belief, their piousness in what they're there for. Now within the mosque, we find two domes, one of which is engulfed in an exquisite gold Macquarna design, which we see here. Again, that three-dimensional form, uh, almost looking like parts of a beehive. The other dome is a more classic dome from the Western perspective, but again covered with these gold tiles. Everything very intricate because, of course, this is the house of God or a house of God, and therefore you're going to put in your best resources. After all, you're trying to worship this being, which is omnipotent, all-powerful, uh, fill in the blank. So you're going to use your best materials and as many of them as you possibly can. The interior decoration, often made with glazed tiles, is covered with abstract floral designs and script from the Quran, the sacred text for Islam, that records the words of Allah as told to the Prophet Muhammad. Now, Islam and Islamic art is an iconic when it comes to religious spaces, meaning that they do not portray human or animal forms. So they do this to discourage the worship of idols. In consequence, most of the decorative forms that we see are going to be either arabesque, so sort of plant-like, geometric, shape-based, or based on Kufic script, the script found and used specifically for the Quran or for writing in mosques. This is no different than seeing quotations from the Bible or the scriptures written within Western churches. Now, while humans are depicted in some Islamic art, they will not be found in the holy space of a mosque. There are certain traditions that we see where even Muhammad can be depicted in art without causing any offense. Some of those generalizations are just that. They're generalizations. They don't apply to every situation. So that's one of those, if you study Islam with greater depth, you will find those exceptions. But in, as a general rule, within a mosque or a religious setting, you will not see human or animal forms to avoid this issue with idolatry or accidentally worshiping the idol rather than the thing or person the idol represents. Now we've dealt with ancient sites, polytheism, monotheism, but there's yet another category, which are sites sacred or spiritual to multiple religions. And this can take a number of different forms. So let me introduce the idea first. Now, at times, due to the location of a structure or due to changes of power within a region, worshippers of more than one religion may share a sacred space. The reuse or altering of sacred space by multiple religions could be harmonious. It could be a matter of 
power or power structure and it could be controversial depending on the circumstance. Let's look at one that we've already dealt with, the Parthenon. Now, the Parthenon was originally a Greek temple. The Romans will use it for much the same purpose, with minor variations. But the Parthenon will then be used as a Christian church. As we see here, it's turned around. Uh, what had been the main entrance on the east side of the temple will suddenly become the back side of the church and the west side will become the entrance as is typical of a Christian church. They take the structure and make it into a Christian church because it's already a powerful site. So it brings a, an air of credibility and power to the Christians that take it. And of course, after 1453, we see the Ottoman Turks in 1456 more specifically uh, invading Athens and the Parthenon will be turned into a mosque by the end of the century. And here we see a very basic sketch of it uh, down here. So we have these examples where different religions are coming in and taking major structures and changing the form. It's still the Parthenon. I mean, the, the very basic fabric of the building is still there. I mean until it blows up, but that's a whole nother matter. But they continue to take the site. Now, we're going to look at three examples. And we're going to look at their at these three examples based on their ability to be universal sacred spaces or spaces in which more than one religion could be practiced or, well, any number of different circumstances. And specifically, we're going to look at the Dome of the Rock, the Hagia Sophia, and the Rothko Chapel, each one sacred to multiple faiths or interdenominational, but different stories behind them. Each one shows a different way that a site can be sacred to multiple religions. For example, the Dome of the Rock gives us the opportunity to discuss how people of different religions have had to coexist because of the incredibly sacred nature of a specific geographic place. The Hagia Sophia is a sacred site whose religious importance has led to it changing over time because it's a very powerful site, not because of the geographic location, but because of the symbolism of the structure itself, very similar to the Parthenon. And the Rothko Chapel is an example of a sacred site designed to welcome people of any religion. So let's get into these three sites. So we start with the Dome of the Rock. Now, the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem is built on a site, specifically the Temple Mount, that is sacred to Jews, Muslims, and Christians and here we see that backed out view and I just want to point out a couple of things and I'm trying to give you some geographic context here obviously the Dome of the Rock is here in the center it is felt that the Temple of Solomon was on this site and we'll get into that a little bit more later here we see this massive mosque on the site of the Temple Mount and this congregation of people here, this is the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, a site sacred to Judaism, as one of the last pieces of the Temple of Solomon. In fact, it's a foundation wall creating the Temple Mount, which originally held the Temple of Solomon. So, as we move on, the Gilded Dome, an octagonal structure, was built to surround a large rock known as the foundation stone. Now, Jews believe that this is the site of the beginning of the world, and Muslims believe it is the rock from which Muhammad ascended to heaven. To Jews and Christians, this site is also thought to be the place where Adam was created and where Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is important to emphasize that although the Dome of the Rock is a sacred space that Muslims visit, it is neither a is not a mosque. In fact, 
Prayer in it would be illegal. You would be arrested today. Rather, it is a shrine to this particular miracle. The Dome of the Rock was completed in its original form in 692 under the Islamic ruler Abid al-Malik. But one can see clear Byzantine influence in the mosaics that decorate the building and exterior of the structure. Now that makes a lot of sense. Why? Because Islam has only existed for a relatively short time. The death of Muhammad is around 632. Here we are 692. We're only 60 years later. It's hardly enough time to develop a culture, much less an artistic tradition. So they're going to look around. They're going to see the mosaic tradition of the Byzantine, who are their relative geographic neighbors, and they're going to borrow it. Even though there are major religious differences, artistically we see a certain amount of pragmatic carryover or cultural hybridization where they're going to borrow these artistic ideas from nearby cultures. Similar to central plan churches created in the Byzantine, the height and diameter of the dome and the length of each of the walls is 67 feet in order to create a proportional harmony and balance. The importance here is not the 67 feet, it's at the length of the walls and the height of the structure is basically the same. Uh, it creates a beautiful proportion. So if I look across, for example, here, looking at the diameter of the main structure, that diameter will be roughly equal or will be equal to the height of the dome over the ground, which creates an appropriate proportion, an attractive proportion. Now unlike the West, in a lot of these Eastern traditions we see very, very different ideas. In the West we tend to leave things as they are, especially important sites such as cathedrals. But in 1993, King Hussein of Jordan will actually donate eight million dollars of his own money to gild the aluminum dome with gold. So we see these major structural changes taking place even uh, some 1300 years after the structure is actually built. We also see heavy massive restoration to the tile work that has gone on and other material changes to the structure. Not unusual. Inside we see verses from the Quran surrounding the rock that pilgrims read as they circle it. Now what happens here is this area this walkway surrounding the rock itself, and fortunately the carpet is red so it's hard to see, but this walkway creates what's called an ambulatory. And the idea is if you're a pilgrim you walk around the ambulatory. There are actually two different levels to the ambulatory. You see split by these columns. And you would see these verses from the Quran, which we see up here, which would give you guidance in your prayers, your thoughts, or your meditations, depending on how you look at it. Now, only Muslims are allowed within the Dome of the Rock. Non-Muslims non are restricted to the Temple Mount outside of the building, and then only at select times. And this is an attempt to try and avoid some of the potential situations that could happen. As I said, this is a site holy to a number of different groups. So you need to have tight control, otherwise you could get into a great deal of sectarian violence between these different religious groups. So you could have a major conflict between the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims over who should have control of the site. And in fact, we do see that on a relatively regular basis if you follow the news out of Jerusalem. Then we come to the Hagia Sophia. Now the Hagia Sophia or the Church of Holy Wisdom was built during the Byzantine Empire. It's originally built in the Roman period by Constantine. It will be rebuilt by Justinian uh, as a place of Christian worship. The original structure by Constantine will be destroyed during the Nikkei Revolt. Uh, we don't have to go into that too much. But the structure itself would be revolutionary for its central dome, which at 180 feet from the ground was the largest building of its time. 
So this is a massive, massive undertaking, especially in that period of the 6th century when Justinian is trying to build the structure. We will have some 40 windows which encircle the base of the dome. And when light shines through the windows, it seems as if the dome is floating because we get that illusion of light underneath the dome, which is darker. Uh, the top of the dome is a little bit darker. There's a light coming in. If you're standing directly below it, it gives you something of the illusion of the dome floating above you, which, given its height, would seem quite miraculous. Christians and imperial subject mosaics covered the walls, including a pancrator, or image of Christ, in the middle of the dome. Now, that, that mosaic is probably still there, but has been covered over, and we'll get into some of that in a moment. Some of these artworks would have been whitewashed during the iconoclastic controversy in the 8th and 9th century to prevent the worship of idols or idolatry. So the Christians themselves will destroy many of these icons prior to the Hagia Sophia becoming a mosque. And of course we do see that shift to becoming a mosque in 1453, following the uh, Sultan Mehmed's conquest of the city. Now, over the next several centuries, some Christian scenes were painted and plastered over, and writings from the Quran were painted on the walls. This makes a lot of sense. Islam is, of course, an iconic, and they aren't going to want these, as they see them, idolatrous images. So they're going to cover them over, and they're going to replace them with their own. They aren't sitting there saying, hey, we really should preserve the Christian heritage, because to them it will always be a mosque. Just like to Christianity, it, they believe that it would always be a church. So this creates, well, some issues, as we'll see later on. They will also install a mihrab, which we see, if I pull up my pen tool, right here, uh, the niche uh, that points towards Mecca, and a minbar, or pulpit, uh, in the mosque, and that we're seeing the steps here going up to the pulpit. We also see four minarets added. Now, the minarets are quite massive, and those would have been there as a show of power, the power of Islam in the area, but also as functional minarets to call prayer. Although you wouldn't have called prayer from the top of a minaret that is well over 100 feet because no one at street level is going to be able to hear you, at least not before modern acoustic technologies. The colossal circular panels called panes with large calligraphic writing were added in the 19th century between 1847 and 1849. So we're seeing modifications, major modifications being made to the church in very modern times, just before the American Civil War. Today, although the site is still considered sacred to many, one of its main purposes is as a museum. And the Turkish government made that transition to create a museum to avoid some of the uh, potential conflict that goes with sites like the Hagia Sophia, where Christians might want it back. Uh, or Islam might fight to make it into a mosque or keep Christians out. and it, They basically say, no, it's going to be a museum at this point. Now, interestingly, as of 2019, and as of the period that I'm recording this, President Erdogan of Turkey is actually calling for the Hagia Sophia to be potentially turned back into a mosque. So this may change as we move forward. Next we come to the Rothko Chapel, the third of our sites sacred to multiple faiths or faith traditions. The Rothko Chapel in Houston, Texas was designed as a sacred space open to people of all beliefs in the 1970s or so. The interior of the octagonal shaped chapel is covered with 14 paintings by Mark Rothko, created specifically for the space and meant to inspire contemplation, 
and meditation. The rectangular painted panels, half black on a maroon background and half ranges of dark purple are extremely large in scale and they tend to take on the form of triptychs hanging on three of the walls. The triptych is chosen because the triptych tends to be a religious form, something that we tend to associate with altarpieces. So he's modernizing this idea, but why is it here? What is it about these Rothko paintings? Well, it's kind of sensory deprivation. The idea is you would sit in front of it, as we see here. The painting takes up most of your peripheral view and basically puts you into a sense of sensory deprivation. You have no input coming in. You aren't listening to things around you because it's silent. You aren't seeing things around you because you're just concentrating on the painting. And what happens is you start really paying attention to your own train of thought. Now you get people having incredible emotional outbursts in front of these pieces. And it's not because of the painting itself, it's because they're dealing with whatever that thing is in their mind that they're concentrating on. And it's an interesting idea. So what Rothko is doing is basically giving you a mirror to your mind. So imagine, how, I mean, just think about how many of you would rather have music or TV or some kind of sound playing in the background while you're doing homework or housework or whatever the situation happens to be. You don't like that idea of silence or sensory deprivation and that issue is growing over time as we get more and more technologies and ideas they're constantly invading our personal space or the space of our mind so what Rothko has done is stripped away all of that so that all you have is your thought process and you have to deal with those whether they're dark whether they're good whether they're happy or sad you are expressing yourself in your own mind Rothko is simply giving you a mirror and in a spiritual setting that makes a lot of sense because these are basically universal. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, etc. You're going to have an experience if you sit down and focus on these for 15 minutes. Now there's not just the interior of the building. The exterior of the building is in the form of of an even-sided Greek cross. Well, that's quite traditional. Uh, so as we look at it, the building itself is cruciform or in the form of this Greek cross. Outside of the chapel, we see a broken obelisk in a reflecting pool. Now, the broken obelisk is, seems quite precarious, uh, and it's made by Barnett Newman in 1967. Now, it was originally dedicated to Martin Luther King Jr., but Newman's work helps to highlight that the Rothko Chapel is also a site that promotes human rights issues. But think about it in a more abstract sense. If I don't know that, I don't know this is a sculpture by Newman, I don't know the story behind it, I'm just walking up and seeing it for the first time. The use of the obelisk is very interesting because we get that sense of a connection between the sky above and the ground below. Now, we tend to associate the sky above with God or gods or spiritual beings. And so it gives us this sense that at this site, whatever your spiritual belief is, connects with the earth. That this is a place where you can commune with your deity. And so we get that sense through the obelisk. Those, that point is so fine that it gives us the idea of the importance of this singular place. And the obelisk is broken to give you the sense of the entire sky pouring into it and bringing all of that spiritual power down to earth at this singular site. The pyramid is a rather universal form and mimics the obelisk giving us that sense of connection from the terrestrial to the eternal in this one spot, this one sacred spot to every religion. So let's wrap this all up. Let's deal with those questions that we started pondering at the very beginning of all of this talk of sacred spaces. 
So my first question was, how do pilgrims or visitors to these sites experience the space? In what way are they guided in their religious practice by the architectural design? And when we look at the spaces, you start to see elements that tell us about their faith. For example, you might have this very small, confined uh, Christian church, not uncommon and gives you a sense of that comfort from the outside world, that shelter that the Christian is feeling in this church, as opposed to some of the Shinto shrines, which are out in nature. Now, this is a nature-based faith, so it makes sense that they're going to be open to the elements, that they're going to bring in those external forces. Really, the architecture is giving us a sense of what is important to each faith. And they're going to use that. They're going to encourage their parishioners, their congregations, whatever term you want to use, in a specific form of practice. And that form has to come out in the space that they use for those services or for worship. Second, are there common attributes to sacred spaces? I would argue that there are at least three. Water, light, and height. Let's look at water first. Now, a number of our sites, such as the Sun Pyramid, include water. In this case, the Sun Pyramid is built on top of a spring, something quite sacred. Water, strangely bubbling from the earth. The Acropolis. You may or may not be aware there is a spring on the Acropolis. And it is seen as particularly important and particularly unusual because you're finding this spring in an elevated location, more to the point, a defensible location, something that made Athens a fantastic strategic city. Chartres was, of course, built on a spring which would become a healing spring, something sacred to the Virgin Mary. And, of course, in Islam, we see the use of fountains or water pools or water sources within the mosque for cleansing, ritualistic cleansing. By the way, you see the same thing in Judaism, in Shinto. We see holy water used in Christianity. Almost every religion at some point offers water or is built around water. But water is almost always there at some level, be it ritualistic cleansing or the placement of the temple. Rothko Chapel, of course, uses it for a different purpose, which is to create a reflecting pool to give you that sense of weightlessness of the obelisk and give you that sense of spirituality meeting the earth. Light becomes particularly important. Now, throughout most of human history, where we live is dark and dank and small, and these churches, for example, would be filled with light. And they're often thinking about it specifically. On the right, we have the Hagia Sophia with that light just beaming in through the windows. On the left, looking up in the choir at Chartres and seeing the light, that very white light, coming in through those colored stained glass windows. Light has always been important. It has always been a symbol of God or gods or the spiritual, depending on how you look at it it probably goes back to the fact that humanity as a whole generally has some element of solar worship at the base of almost every religious system that has ever existed. We also have height. Now, height can take on a number of different forms, so I want to touch on it real briefly. You can have the idea of the artificial mountain, which we see with the Pyramid of the Sun, where the Sela, a small temple, would have been placed at the very top of it, where all the rituals would have taken place. The idea is, be closer to gods. And where do the gods or God live? In the sky. We see the same thing with the Parthenon, built on the highest point in Athens, the Acropolis. Again, closer to the gods. We see the same thing in India, 
where instead of building closer to the gods, they're mimicking the home of the gods. They're creating an artificial mountain, but instead of worshiping on top of it, it is symbolic of the home of Shiva in this case. Or we see the verticality of Chartres, which is to draw the eye up to the sky because in Western Europe at the time, if you look up towards the sky, you're going to get that sense of the spiritual. The Dome of the Rock, which dominates the general landscape of Jerusalem. It's built on the highest point or one of the highest points at the time. So it's going to be a position of power. Here, instead of being closer to God, it's more about power. And we tend to see that in the West. We also see it in Istanbul with the construction of the Hagia Sophia on a hill at the highest point of the city, but also this massive structure. And then the Ottoman Turks in 1453, after they've taken over the city, will build those massive minarets actually towering over the Hagia Sophia to give, again, give that sense of power. So sometimes it's about messaging the house of God or symbolism about God or drawing your eye up. Sometimes it's about being closer to the God and sometimes it's about power. Who is in power in that city? And at a certain time in European history, that would be incredibly important. That's why we see the Dome of the Rock and the Hagia Sophia where they are and going through the history that they do. Finally, why do societies put so many resources into the construction of sacred spaces? After all, these are resources that could feed people. These are resources that could go towards any number of other things that could arguably be more pragmatic and more useful to humanity. But, and this is a big but, we all have fears. We all have questions. We fear death. We question where we go after death. We need to know why some unfortunate things happen. It's easier to believe in some form of spirituality than it is to believe that the world is in fact random and that in many cases, random events will simply happen. As humans, we don't like that idea. Now add to that, the comforts that are given through various religions, add to that the community that comes from not just the religion itself, but the construction of the temple, and you start to see why we're putting so many resources into this. And then there's always that issue of Pascal's wager. Let's build a massive structure so that the god or gods will see how much they mean to us and hopefully look down well upon us. And by the way, if we built the structure and we didn't need to, we're not really out that much in theory. Now, when we're dealing with medieval cathedrals and they're using as much as 30% of the entire income of the village, that's a whole nother ball of wax. But we always get with religion, this sense of comfort, this sense of foundation and stability that people find comfort in. So they're going to put more resources into it because it makes them feel better. Now, there's lots of other theories about it. That's what I'm going with here. So this brings us to the end of Sacred Spaces.